Okay, uh, thanks Kim and thanks also to the rest of the organizers for giving me opportunity to speak in this wonderful seminar series. So today I would like to tell you about our recent work on how we can design morphology of cell phases in multi-component liquid mixtures and all of the details you can find in these uh, archive uh, preprint. And what motivated us to study uh, this morphology of separated phases uh, is uh, intercellular phase separation, right? So if you look at the classical textbook, biology textbook of the structure of eukaryotic cells, you would see that it has like a lot of internal compartments. And for a long time, it was thought they're physically separated by the rest of the environment via membranes. But in the last decade or so, it was recognized there are like lots of um, also membraneless organelles or condensates we have, which form via classic, we are liquid liquid like uh, phase separation. And they're also important for many, many uh, different uh, cellular functions. And there, in the, and there are also like lots of very excellent reviews that have been written on these topics. And here are like some of them, but there are actually more. So where you can read more about this uh, if you're interested in this topic. And to just to give you an example, I'm gonna show you an example of nucleoli, which happens inside the cell nucleus. And here in particular are nucleola of the frog X, Xenophon levis, right? And uh, so here, like, you know, like they marked like different um, molecules with fluorescent tags. And now when they disrupted actin, uh, what you will see that like all of these different phases, they kind of come and merge together and they coalesce. And if you just stare at these, this really looks like just like liquid phases that are coming together and, and coalescing, right? So on one hand, this looks like just ordinary fluids, like, you know, just the, the mixing of oil and water. But, you know, we should remember, remind ourselves that this is happening in a very complex cellular environment. And these are like multi-component uh, uh, fluids, right? Uh, and interestingly, like we see that there is also some structure to these fluids in particular, like nucleoli has like multiple different domains and they're like nested, they're hier hierarchical. So these blue regions, these are called fibrillar centers, which forms on the, uh, uh, on the DNA sites that encode for the ribosome proteins, right? And inside, inside these blue uh, fibrillar centers, you first have like transcription of the ribosomal RNA. Then, then in these green centers, which are these dense fibrillar components, what happens that these like uh, translated RNAs, uh, these RNAs get uh, translated into the proteins. And then in these red granular centers, then these ribosomes uh, are actually assembled from all of these different uh, protein components, right? Uh, so basically like this structure of nucleoli kind of facilitates the, uh, assemb the production of the ribosomes uh, and it's very important. And in many other condensates, you know, like their structure is also uh, connected, tied to their uh, function. Uh, interestingly, like, you know, like lots of these structures, they're not static, but they're dynamic. So, you know, like there are many examples when, you know, these condensates dynamically form or, or fall up or, or um, break apart during different cell cycles. But also like if you use different drugs, it can also affect their structures. For example, if we take nucleoli, so these are now uh, experiments from uh, Manuela Leonetti's group at um, Chen Zuckerberg Biohub. So, so these are now the nucleoli in human cells, but if you treat them with actinomycin uh, D, which inhibits the RNA transcription, what they will find that these green fibrillar centers will migrate from the inside towards the surface of these granular components. So that will form these uh, nucle nucleolar caps, right? So, so, so interestingly, like, you know, like we can actually change uh, morphology, right? And, and so I hope, like I showed you in this one example that like it's important to understand what is the morphology of these biological condensates because uh, it's also tied to function, right? This kind of motivated us to study just like uh, the classical thermodynamic problem of liquid mixtures, but now we, instead of having just two or three components, we consider that we have like multiple components and different components are marked with different symbols. And we would like to know, like if I, if I know like how these molecules interact with each other and what is their concentration, like, uh, like uh, and if they undergo phase separation, we would like to know into how many different phases they will uh, phase separate, what will be the composition of each phase. For example, the blue phase may be enriched with star molecules, but the red phase may be enriched with big circle molecules. And we would also like to know how these uh, like phases will arrange in space. And, and here uh, we're going to ignore any active processes that are important in cells, 
but who, here we're just going to study the passive uh, phase separation that is just driven by the thermodynamics. Okay, so here in all of these examples, I'm, we're going to use the Flory Huggins model, uh, where, the, uh, the, where the free energy density normalized by the KT uh, has two contributions. One is coming from the mixing entropy and one from the interaction energy where the CI are the volume fractions of the different uh, molecules. And, and so, so you know, I will go from one to N when N is the total number of different components. And, and you know, like, uh, we're gonna assume that this is incompressible so that the, the sum of all the volume fractions is equal to one. Uh, and chi IJ is like a matrix that encodes pairwise interactions between different types of uh, molecules. Uh, and, and you know, like if you, if you study, like so, so like if you look at uh, any classical thermodynamics course, when you study binary mixture, but you find that if the free energy is a function of the concentration of one of the species is non-convex, then in this region between um, these two green lines, this, the, 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 this would be the energy of the mixture, but actually you can lower this free energy to this value if you phase separate into a, one region uh, which has comp uh, concentration CA and another region which has concentration CB, right? Uh, and, and how you can find the concentration of these two phases, you can use the standard Maxwell com common tangent construction, right? So we have a common tangent to this curve and these two tangent uh, attachment points, these are the concentrations of the two phases. And we can also use the lever rule to figure out how much of the phase A and how much of the phase B you will get, right? So if we, so if we generalize these from binary the multi-component mixtures, then in general, we're dealing with the free energy uh, function in a highly in, in a multi-dimensional space, right? So it's still possible to generalize this Maxwell common tangent construction. So now we're looking instead of common tangent, we're looking at common tangent hyperplanes and the attachments would be compositions and the number of different uh, uh, ten, uh, attachment points would be the number of, of phases and it will uh, generalize their compositions. So, you know, like uh, this is uh, not so easy to do, but here we employed a, a, a trick uh, that we learned from uh, the, this PRL paper like about a decade ago from Fabrice Talman and Carlos Marquez's group, where they figure out that you can use convex hull construction. If I go back, like what you see that like, you know, like basically like this non-convex region, we can replace with these red line. So this will basically convexify the free energy, right? So, and the idea is that like they figure out to use the convex hull to read off the information, right? So the idea is the following. So like, you know, you start with the, your initial phase phase, you discretize it and you calculate the free energy at these discrete points. And then once you run, you run a convex hull algorithm, which convexifies the free energy. And if you project it back to the phase space, you will see that some triangles still remain small, but some of the triangles got stretched. And it was like, and, and like it was, the, what was the advantage of these spiral papers that they figure out how to read off the information from these stretch triangles, which basically tells you the, where are the regions that uh, phase separate. And if they got stretched in one direction, they correspond to two phases. And if it got stretched in multiple directions, they correspond to the three phases. And these corner points are actually composition, concentrations of different phases. And then we can again use the lever rule to figure out how much of the each vol uh, phase, volume, the volume of each phase. And in this soft matter paper last year, we generalized this idea from ternary mixtures to, multi to more than three component mixtures, uh, because like a lot of these geometrical <coughs> effects uh, can be generalized to multi-component mixtures. Okay, so, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about this algorithm, but I was just wanted to mention it, right? So, but we can use this convex hull algorithm to construct phase diagrams. And this is useful because, you know, in, in, if inside the cell, like, you know, like you're, you, uh, we are tweaking concentrations of, of some molecules, we can see how we navigate this uh, phase space and we can see how many different phases we're gonna get, what will be their volumes and their compositions. But based on just this phase diagram, we know nothing about like how these phases will arrange in space. Because here we just created the bulk energy, free energy of the system, but if we want to know how they will arrange in space, we need to take into account the interfacial free energy uh, between uh, these different phases, right? So here we follow the kant hilliard procedure where we add these gradient terms. Uh, and here lambda is the characteristic uh, width of the interface between the two phases. And, and here we assume that all the molecules are small, uh, right? So, so that we uh, ignore any, any of the um, uh, entropy that would happen between in polymer melts. 
for example, right? So here, uh, so this, uh, this is the expression when we assume these are small molecules, if you have the polymer metal, this would look somewhat different. And you might be wondering about this minus sign and this minus sign is actually correct. And it comes from the fact that the total, the sum of all the concentrations is equal to one. So, so you know, one of the concentrations is one minus the other ones, which will give you like a minus sign. And then what we're gonna do now, uh, I'm just gonna show you like a bunch of simulations. Well, we're gonna evolve the system, which will try to lower the free energy. And, and we're just gonna follow the standard hunt Hiller dynamics, where these are chemical potentials. Divergence of the chemical gradients of chemical potentials will drive flow and MIJ are mobility coefficients where D are diffusion coefficients. Here for simplicity, we assume that all molecules have the same diffusion coefficients, but we can change this if we need it. And then divergence of the flow will tell you how locally the concentration evolves in time. And we'll, I'm gonna show you a bunch of simulations in 3D uh, with periodic boundary conditions where what we're gonna change, we're gonna change this interaction matrix chi ij and we're gonna change the initial concentration CI. So we're gonna start with roughly uniform concentration in space plus a little bit of noise, right? And here are some representative uh, oscillations. And you can see that the morphologies that uh, we are seeing in these simulations are quite different. And also you can see that all of these morphologies, they coarsen over time. So, so, small, so small droplets or, or small structures are disappearing while the large structures are growing, and this is so-called oswald ripening, right? And we would like to know what determines uh, these morphologies. And as you can imagine, what is really important are surface tensions, uh, and depending on the magnitudes of surface tensions, we have so-called partial wetting or complete wetting regime. So if surface tensions are such that all of them uh, obey the triangle inequality, such that each surface tension is smaller than the sum of the other two, then we're gonna have like table three triple junctions uh, where this, uh, if you think of these surface uh, tangents that pull in different directions, we have basically like a force balance on these three triple junctions. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, if we run the simulations, we'll see that these triple junctions are quite stable, they persist, right? So you see that again, there's a coarsening, but three triple junctions like this, they're quite stable and they persist. On the other hand, if one of the surface uh, tensions or surface energies, let's say this between red and blue phase is very large, much larger than the sum of the other two, then these three cannot be in the force balance, right? Because gamma R, these two cannot balance this large force. So if these three happen to meet together, the, this red and blue surface tension is gonna pull away this and the green will come in between to try to shield the red and blue from each other to try to get rid of this unwanted large surface energy. So now if we run this simulation, you see that indeed green goes in between red and blue to shield them uh, from each other. And here in both simulations, I used uh, equal volume fractions. Uh, and for just to introduce like uh, the graph representation, which will become very handy when we generalize this to more than three component, uh, three phases, uh, I'm gonna introduce these connectivity graphs where the nodes correspond to phases and, and a link in this graph will respond to the phases that share the interface. And here by interface, I mean like a 2D interface uh, in 3D space. So just like a, if, if the phases just meet at a point, uh, that's not enough to, to have a link, right? So here we see because of these triple junctions, all of the phases are in contact with each other. So we have a fully connected graph, but here red and blue never see each other. So we have like a missing link, right? And later on, whenever you see these graphs, you should remember that they're basically representing you these inequalities for surface tension. So a fully connected graph, we're gonna have this partial wetting inequality, whereas for the graph with a missing link, we have this complete wetting uh, inequality. Okay, so surface tensions are important, but also the volume fractions uh, can affect things, right? For example, here on the left, I have equal volume fractions of red, uh, green, and blue phases, but here I have like a lot of blue phases and I have like just a little bit of red and blue phases. If these, and, and if the volume fractions are small enough, uh, they're gonna break into small droplets, but the topology is gonna stay the same. So here you still see that I have like these triple junctions between, uh, between uh, red, green, and blue phases, uh, just like here. But here the volume fractions are large enough that these phases percolate through the whole system, but here they break the droplets because of the Rayleigh plateau instability, right? The same thing happens on the right. So if I play this again, uh, you see that even on the right, the green still separates the red uh, from the blue environment. So now we have these encapsulated droplets, right? So, so the, 
So both the surface tensions and the volume fractions are important for the actual morphology. And what I will claim is that the surface tension determine topology, which I will represent with this connectivity graph, whereas the volume fractions also dictate the, the, actual, the, the, the actual geometry of the system. Okay, so now how do we go? So and you know, this has been well known for three uh, liquid phases. How now we go, how do we generalize these ideas to more than three phases? So let's say that we have already determined that we have four coexisting phases and we have determined the surface tensions, right? How can we now uh, predict how, how these phases will arrange space? So we should be able to gain some, uh, we should be able to use some information by just knowing what the, uh, the, three, the triplets of the phases are doing. So let's say that we have the following example. Let's say that the red, blue, and green uh, are in these partial wetting conditions. So all of, they like to have stable triple junctions, but like white, red, and green have a complete wetting where red completely wets the white and green phases and shield them from each other. And the same for white and blue phases. And, and let's say that green and blue and white are also form three functions. So, so, you know, like if locally we have three phases uh, come together, we know how they will arrange. They will arrange like this, right? So now how can we combine these to figure out how the four phases will arrange in space? And here the idea is simple. So let's start with a, let's start with a graph with four nodes representing four phases and start with a fully connected graph. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna iterate over uh, these subgraphs, and now I'm gonna look for any missing edge that I see in these subgraphs. I'm gonna remove this edge in a full graph uh, with four phases. So now I move the white and green because of here and the white and blue because of here, right? So now this graph predicts that like red, green, uh, green and blue should all, you know, be in contact with each other, but white is only in contact with red. So red effectively separates white from green and blue. So now if you run this simulation, that's indeed what we see, right? You see that the white is encapsulated by red and then the red is in contact with all of the other phases. And then, you know, green and blue never see white because they're shielded by the red, okay? So now this is very helpful. And it's important to note that there are actually many different, that there are multiple, there can be multiple ways into which you can get the same final morphology. For example, in the top and bottom row, I have two different cases where the first three, uh, uh, inequalities for surface tension are the same, but the last one is different. So here we see that like we have a fully connected graph between white, green, and blue, but here the link between white and blue is missing, right? But if I follow that procedure that I mentioned before, uh, like, like I already removed white and blue link here, so it doesn't matter that I removed it twice, right? So the final, uh, the final morphology looks exactly the same for these different cases. You look, you see, you can see that it looks very, very similar. And the only thing, different things is that transients can be different because for example, here, if green, blue, and white see each other, they're gonna stuck together. And then when red comes, uh, uh, red comes along, it's gonna separate uh, them like here. Whereas here, the green would go in between blue and white, but when red comes along, it's gonna separate green from white. But you know, like at least visually, uh, they look very similar. And then this graph representation can also be very useful because you can ask, okay, so what are all the possible ways into which I can arrange these phases? So we can just enumerate all the topological distinct graphs. Uh, and, and here are also representative uh, simulations where again, I had equal volume fractions of all the phases. And that was also true for the previous simulations. And you see that these morphologies can be quite different. Like there is something interesting that you may notice here, which is different from the other ones, is that here you have these uh, points that we call quadruple junctions where the four different phases uh, meet together. So typically, uh, normally you don't really expect them because it's an energetically more favorable to break these quadruple junctions into uh, uh, two triple junctions. Uh, and that's indeed the case for most cases, but actually we can show that these quadruple junctions are stable here because if we try to separate, if we try to break apart these quadruple junctions, we create a new interface and this surface and the conditions for these graphs are such that these new surface uh, energy, surface tensions, these new surfaces that we create, they carry surface uh, tension such that this dominates over the other two and this dominates over these two. So these two triple junctions get pulled back together. And the same, the same is true here. If we break it in the other direction and create this green and white interface, they would again get pulled together. So these quadruple junctions are actually like locally stable in this system, right? So, so if you have equal volume fractions, you're gonna see a lot of them. But if I change 
the volume fractions, and now uh, I use the same surface tensions, but I just tweak concentration uh, of the molecules to get uh, different, uh, to get like more of white phases and less of the other three phases. Then they're gonna break into droplets, and you know now the morphologies of droplets can be quite different. Uh, and notice that here the quadruple junctions got away just because the four phases never got a chance to meet each other, uh, so so they never managed to form. But you still see that like maybe you have these green droplets that are coated by red and blue so that they never see white, right? And these graphs, they basically are like, they represent the, the, the connectivity graphs of different phases uh, that you see here. Okay, so, 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 you know, like these graphs can be very useful to solve the forward problem. So if I, if I tell you what are the phases and if I tell you what are the surface tension, you know, like I can just uh, follow this procedure that uh, I indicated here, where I first in, uh, uh, look at the triplets of phases and, and I uh, write their corresponding graphs. And then I just uh, iterate, iterate and construct a fully connected graph and I iterate over the subgraphs and remove all the links that are needed to get the final connectivity graph. And you know, here I showed the example with four phases, but this approach can be generalized to five or more phases if you want, right? Okay, but now, now the final step we wanted to do is also, let's say that we wanna also reverse engineer conditions that would give rise to uh, certain structures. Let's say that you know, like, uh, your biology friends tells you, oh, like we would really like to have a structure like this, right? So what should, like, what, and then we would like to, then we need to tell them, like, you know, like what are sort of the uh, molecules and uh, that you, they would need to uh, pair uh, and what should be their interaction in order to get this target structure, okay? And the procedure is the following. First, we can take a look at the structure and we can create a connectivity graph. So you see that the red one is in contact with blue, green, and white, right, and so on. So we just look at all the phases uh, that are connected. And then we take this graph and, and we create like subgraph of all the possible triplets, right? So for five graph with five components, there are 10 possible triplets. And what you see that uh, for these sets of graphs, they look like the ones that I showed you before. This is like a fully connected. So this is like a partial in case. This is like a fully, uh, this is like one with the one missing link. So this is like a complete wedding of blue, uh, of green and white also some graphs that look different. They either have like just one link and sometimes you can also have cases where they have no links, right? And for these graphs, I told you how we can translate these graphs to inequalities between surface tangents uh, and for these graphs, but for these graphs, I don't really know uh, how to write these, like these don't really give me any conditions for the surface tangent, right? So now let's see if we actually need these graphs. Uh, so, you know, like, uh, so if I try to, as I mentioned, if we went, uh, if we did the forward problem, like, you know, like then uh, here sorry. these graphs, yes? So sorry, but you have about a minute left. Okay, thank you. So, so this graph will remove the green, uh, the gray and white, this graph will remove the gray and red link, uh, this graph will remove the blue and uh, green link, but there is no graph uh, that will remove the red, uh, the, the, the green, like I forgot, the gray, the, the red and blue link. Right, so we have to uh, great, so we have to add other condition uh, that would uh, do this, right? And so basically, then we convert this graph to inequality for surface tangents. Uh, so this is the green and uh, blue uh, gray thing. So then, what we can write, we can write inequalities for these surface tangents. And when we solve these inequalities for surface tangents, we can get like a representative solution, which will give me surface tangents. Of course, in my simulations, I don't put, put in surface tensions, but I put in interaction parameters and concentrations. So in general, there's still like a non-trivial step to go from surface tensions to interaction parameters. But uh, in, in the, in the Flory Huggins model, we were able to do this in some regime. And then finally, we can also tweak concentrations to get the right volume fractions. And here is the uh, final morphology. And indeed, that we got through this procedure, and indeed looks uh, like similar to the one uh, that we want to start with. Uh, so here are uh, here are two more examples that we did. So you know, like in the spirit of the nucleoli, we wanted to have like a nested structure. Uh, so here we did like a nested structure with five phases, which are correspond to this line graph. And on the right, we wanted to encapsulate you know like three phases, uh, three different phases that are shielded from each other. Uh, in, in some uh, environment, right? Uh, so in the last thing I wanna mention 
is that like here in all of these movies, like it looked like everything, all of the phases separate at once, but you can also have cases where, where the phase separation happens in stages. Uh, for example, I'm going to show first a 2D and a 3D version where you see that first you get two phases that form and then one of them separates into three more phases, right? So sometimes this spinal decomposition can happen in, uh, in uh, multiple uh, stages. Uh, so you get like these pearl structures that eventually break into droplets because the relative plateau instability. And this is also like uh, the 3D uh, version. Okay, uh, so in the future, in the future, uh, we are also uh, like, uh, so currently what we're also working on is like how these phase, so, you know, like in the simulations, we assume that the phase separation is happening in a liquid medium, but often in cell, like they're happening inside some viscoelastic medium. So we're also, because, and we're also studying like how uh, the interaction of the phase separation with this like uh, and, uh, viscoelastic environment in general can affect the coarsening and can also like uh, select their sizes, as was demonstrated in experiments by Eric Dufresne, uh, who's also uh, in the audience. And we're also uh, working with the people at the Chen Zuckerberg Biohub uh, to study like, you know, like how these uh, actimize and detreatment can lead to rearrangements of these uh, phases in, in the nucleola. So with this, let me end. Uh, and I'll just acknowledge uh, people who are involved. So Sheng Mao was my former postdoc, uh, who is now assistant professor at Peking University, and he developed the code and lots of theoretical development. Milena Chakraverti uh, uh, was uh, is a recent graduate at Princeton, uh, who worked with me uh, uh, on this project as a junior. And actually, like she was the one who came up with this idea to use graphs uh, to represent these different morphologies. Uh, and Hunter and Derek were two RU students who helped running simulations and also benefited a lot uh, with collaborations with Nico Hataya. Uh, like I said, the, all of the details are in this archive preprint, and then the previous work on the constructing phase diagrams with the console is published in these software papers. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, thanks, Andre. Thanks again um, for an excellent talk, and there's lots of questions, uh, but we uh, don't have, we only have two minutes left, and so uh, there's a few uh, questions about um, active processes. And so at the beginning, Raphael uh, asked, is the liquid-liquid phase separation in cells a non-equilibrium process, and how do you include it in your model? And later, Sriram and others um, uh, asked about um, how much of the phenomenology do you describe? Do you think will persist in the presence of actively energy energy dissipating processes as occur in living cells. And there, there's a few more that I can find. But yeah, thank okay. you. I mean, that's a very important question. Uh, so definitely like uh, there are lots of activity in biological systems, but it is thought that the, dr the, the main drivers of this phase separation are basically like passive thermodynamic forces, right? And dynamic processes can actively tune concentrations and navigate the, the, the phase space and the phase diagram uh, of course, like it can also like effectively, uh, like some of the active process can also like effectively renormalize some of the surface tensions. And in that, can, in that sense, they could also affect things. And there were some of the studies in the past few years, like where people were simulating uh, these like active particles. And they show that like lots of these classical phenomenology uh, can also be translated to the active uh, Brian particles and so on. So I think even though like this was like a purely, uh, passive thermodynamics, like a lot of the phenomenology uh, will be also applicable to active systems. But of course, uh, then, you know, in active systems, you can also have like a, a more interesting uh, dynamics uh, that will happen. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, so I will ask one more question, maybe, uh, I mean, from the chat. Uh, but I have to go as host, um, and uh, Meredith will take over for the informal uh, chat. I'm uh, teaching a class in a few minutes. And so uh, Purnima um, asks about, uh, uh, is there any difference be in the behavior when the phase separation occurs by nucleation or growth or by spinal decomposition? And is this relevant or is the link scale you're looking at larger than the critical nuclei? And 
So oh, maybe yeah, so. I'll ask that for Pranima and then I apologize for leaving. Yeah, so that's a good point. So, so, so here we're, so like I forgot to mention, like in all of these simulations, we just looked at the spinodal decomposition. There was no nucleation here. Uh, of course, like I think morphology, uh, like the, 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 the rules that I told you about how to figure out morphology, uh, are, they don't care whether the phases happen via nucleation or phase separation because we assume that they, you know, they, they are large, they have coarsened enough and they are large enough, they have opportunity to see each other. Uh, uh, but uh, so, you know, like the, the, the kinetics will be different whether, I mean, the, the initial kinetics will be different whether like you're generating phases with a spinodal decomposition or nucleation, but final stages will be the same, right? But uh, definitely, uh, like some of these nucleations uh, like are important, like, you know, in biology, like if you really want to have like a nice control, like quite often you don't want to rely on the nucleation. Uh, like you maybe just want to tweak concentration to go to the spinal region so that things are really fast because nucleation can sometimes be slow. And so, and you want to have like an optical control uh, how fast. And then like, you know, like maybe you also have like these nucleation centers, like I said, uh, nucleoli, uh, they first uh, start assembling around the specific DNA regions that encode for the ribosome proteins. Good. Um, we're at a good point to stop the formal presentation. So go ahead and stop the.